Machine learning is another tool in the toolbox. It is a powerful tool. It can do stuff that previous tools cannot do, but at the same time, you need to be very careful with it. Welcome to the Millennial Investing Podcast. I'm your host, Rebecca Hotsko, and in today's episode, I'm joined by Mike Chen. Mike, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Rebecca. It's a pleasure to be here. It's great to have you here. I spoke with your colleague, Pim Van Fleet, in a previous episode. We were talking all about quantitative investing strategies related to factor investing. And in today's episode, I'm really interested to have you on the show to talk about a different aspect of quantitative investing related to alternative data and machine learning techniques. Absolutely. So you are head of Alternative Alpha Research at Robeco. To kick off today's conversation, I think it'd be helpful to start off by having you explain to our listeners what alternative data is. Yeah, so thank you for that question. So um, if you think about it, right, um, alternative data has sort of been around with us, you know, since the beginning of investing, right? You know, back back in, I guess, two or 3,000 years ago, you know, the ancient Egyptian and Roman grain traders would, you know, they would look at the weather and, you know, determine whether the this year's harvest is going to be good. And they, they might put a, you know, future price on it. Right. But I think what made it, what, you know, made this term come into vogue in the recent, I would say 10, 15 years or so is really the explosion, the amount of alternative data that's available. Right. And, and to, to basically compare and contrast this, you have what's called the traditional financial data, which are information coming from, um, coming from financial statements. So, you know, balance sheet, cash flow statements, and also basically just market price, right? You know, what, what has this security done in the last one, one month, one week, so on and so forth. That is what's termed the traditional data. And then alternative data is anything outside of that. So, you know, because of the information and communication revolution that we have, um, lived through in the past, you know, two decades, the amount of these data is actually exploding. So, you know, anything from satellite image, to to your basically your location data because of your cell phone to um to your to your web searches and your in your uh, social media right to um to actually w- uh, what people say uh to to shipping manifest right to what you know what's on the container ship uh, and where those ships are um to to you know to even to where you know like private jet flight records these are all information that can if used properly be uh, applied to financial uh, investment. So this um, this really exploding sort of data um, that's, you know, again, that has become very, very popular um, over the last 20 years, 15 to 20 years or so, is what we turn alternative data in the investment industry. And um, as you mentioned, there's a lot of interest in this kind of data and, um, you know, a lot of people are uh, looking for ways to apply them into their investment. Can you talk a bit about who's mainly using this and then why you're using it? Yeah. So I, I think, you know, to use alternative data in the sense I describe, I think mainly started with quantitative investors. So, um, you know, so these are relatively large investment houses, right? Such as, you know, such as ourselves you know, such as BlackRock um, and, and, you know, a lot of quantitative hedge funds. So, you know, you think Millennium, Millennium um, Two Sigma, these, these investment houses uh, would, would uh, are, are typically the one that historically has been using them, right? And because, you know, people have found success with, with, with using these alternative data and in investing and, you know, and, and the fact that they can get information that's really not readily available using traditional data sources, even fundamental investor, right? So people that basically um, invest according to their own analysis, you know, to to how they feel about a certain certain company. Even fundamental uh, investors are now actually in um, in the in a hunt for alpha via alternative data. So so really anybody nowadays are you know on the institutional side are, are actually using these kind of uh, data sources. 
So then you named a couple sources of alternative data. I'm curious to know who are the providers of that and is that available to everyone or are you purchasing it and then it's solely yours? How does that work? Yeah, it's interesting. So there is actually quite a diverse alternative data ecosystem in investing. Some of these data are actually for free. Anybody can use them. For example, if you want to, you know, look at a um, employee sentiment, right? How has uh, how does a company's employees feel about the company, the management, the outlook, the benefits, etc. You can just go on the internet, right, to look to look for them. Um, a lot of information uh, is actually available for free. A lot of NGOs, right? So if they, you know, they if they find uh, malfeasance with certain companies' operation or their conduct, they are uh, publicly listed. Um, a lot of uh, government agencies, when they, you know, when they, when they find a given company, right, that information is publicly listed. Some of them are, have, do have, some of these data do have to be purchased, right? You know, for example, I, I mentioned a, um, a shipping manifest. This is what's called as exhaust data, right? It, 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 these are data that's generated through a company's normal operation. You know, if you're if you're a global shipping company, a uh, freight company, you're shipping you know um, these cargos from A to B. You know, you you would actually have a meta, you would actually know what you're shipping, right? You have to know. And, and you know, typically, what happened historically, what happens is that these companies just sell this data. They say, oh well, this is something that we use just to keep records, and maybe we can file tax. And you know, regulator comes and say, hey, what's in this crate? We know, but. Re, you know, in recent years, they say, wow, hey, you know, people are actually looking for this data. So maybe I can sell it. Right. So so um, so some com- so some of these data you do have to buy. Uh, some are available for free. It really is all over the place. Are you also creating in-house data through different machine learning techniques or anything like that? Yeah. So we don't create data per se. Um, there are techniques in machine learning where if the data is very imbalanced, uh, and, I'll, and I'll define what that means later, we can you know, use, there's techniques you can use to make the data more balanced so that machine learning algorithms perform better. What I mean by imbalanced data is that, um, for example, um, you know, say, say in, in, in medical research, you wanna study rare disease, right? So you look for um, key metrics uh, or you know KPIs that that would indicate the presence of these disease. Now, these disease because they're rare by definition only happens in a very small sample set, right? So so when you when you study them, um, you know a lot of people do not have them. So then then what happens is that this creates a problem for machine learning because there's not a lot of samples for it to learn. So then you know machine learning can create artificial samples to make it larger. So we do use these techniques to create artificial samples to make the data set more balanced. But in general, we don't create data sets because we want data to be from, um, from, from real, real life, you know, real events, real people, real society, et cetera. So, so to, so that we, so that we could, you know, invest accordingly. Right. But what we do actually is that in addition to data that's, you know, curated, that's put out there for sale or, or just, you know, for public consumption, right, from NGOs, et cetera, we do collect our own data sometimes. And I, you know, for example, um, that there may be a data set that we find, hey, this is interesting and useful, but uh, it's not really available uh, in general. So what we do is we, we sometimes we go out and collect the data ourselves. For example, through web scraping, right? When we web scrape the data, um, once we have that data, then it's something that we, we have to access to. But these are all public data, right? So, so we do collect them ourselves. A couple of the alternative data sets that really stuck out to me were, were credit card transactions and then mm-hmm. the digital or satellite, because it just seems like there could be so many applications for those having that data. I'm wondering if there are any others that would be maybe surprising that retail investors would be interested to learn about. You're definitely right. So, you know, for example, your um, your, your credit card transactions, right? What you buy and what you sell, not just credit card, debit card um, and satellite. I think these stuff are directly impact the retail investor because they become the data, right? Um, you know, others of that nature would be, for example, their, their footfall traffic. Where, where do they go, actually, right? You know, because you have a cell phone with you, you have a smartphone with you and, 
every you know every few seconds it's actually sending well actually probably higher frequency than that it's sending out a location information to the base station so so technically if people actually go really deep you, they, they can actually know where you are at all time right um, so so that tracking information is there you know your your internet search events or your uh, purchase information that's actually also available. Uh, now I have to say that obviously all of this is anonymized, right? So your, your credit card purchases, it doesn't identify you personally, individually. I say, okay, this person, you know, for example, myself, Mike went and bought a, uh, bought a new iPad this weekend in downtown Boston, right? Uh, that's that kind of information level is actually taken up, but so it's called, so these data are what we call anonymized in the business, but you know, they, they do look at a, uh, a group of people or, you know, a geographical area, you know, so that in general, you can tell kind of trends that's happening rather than individual, but, you know, you can tell what's happening, say, in this specific region um, for this specific demography, what's happening, what are they purchasing, are they cutting back on their purchase, or are they spending more in this area, et cetera. I'm wondering if you can talk a bit about which sectors stand to benefit the most from the yep. use of alternative data. That's interesting. So I, I think actually all sectors can benefit, right? Um, you know, because, you know, uh, for example, right, for the energy sector, people have been using satellites to see, you know, whether the oil storage facilities are full or they empty, uh, you know, to track the, the shipment of oil tankers, right? Uh, in the in industrial sector, they, they actually look at, you know, smokestack, whether, whether the you know, factory is running or not using infrared signatures. Um, you know, for, uh, for, sh for transportation, they, they look at, you know, they look, they count how many trucks are in the various, you know, like, like, uh, transportation centers, right? Whether they're, you know, is, is it empty or is it full? But I think, you know, two sectors, uh, above and beyond all these other sectors really benefit are the consumer facing sectors, consumer discretionary and consumer staples. Mainly, you know, really because there's just more data out there, right, for consumers, right? You know, like I, I just mentioned that well, there's credit card transactions being tracked, um, you know, uh, where they go, are they go into certain stores, you know, uh, you know, I think of, you can look at, you know, uh, parking lots to see if the parking lots are full for, for certain retailers, right? You could, uh, you can see, uh, what people search for. In Google, right, using Google Google Trends, which is publicly available, to see, oh, are they searching for, you know, there's, you know, we have an Apple's uh, event coming up. Are they searching for um, app, uh, iPhone 14 Pro, right, as an indication of interest? So consumer facing, um, I think, above and beyond all the other sectors, that typically probably benefit more um, from the rise of alternative data, simply because there's more data available, right. So when I was looking into this, I found that there were kind of three main use cases for alternative data to inform investment decisions. So one would be to find new investment ideas. So you mentioned this um, using a satellite to kind of examine the number of cars in a parking lot of a retail store to gauge consumer spending. Two would be to validate an existing investment idea. So use satellite images to track the number of vehicles in a car dealership, for example. And this could be used to as information that the dealership is doing well. And then three, monitor investments. So a quant or hedge fund might use social media data to track consumer sentiment about a particular company. And then if the sentiment is negative, the hedge fund may decide to sell its shares in the company. I'm wondering if those are all accurate and then if there's any more that are used that I didn't name there. Um, that is definitely very accurate. Um, you know, so, so you basically name the entire investment cycle, right? From idea generations to validation to exit decision, right? So the three examples you gave actually cover the whole spectrum. I think those are very good examples. You know, you can use it many different ways, right? For example, you can use, say, NGO data to see if the you know, if a gov if a company is being fined, right, are they committing violations that are serious or not? There's data you can use to see, um, you know, how many lawsuits are <laughs> against a given company, right? Uh, so, so even more than just whether the inv investment, you know, which investment you need to get into, you can it could actually analyze, you know, do these companies in general have good characteristics, right? Strong management, so on and so forth. So, so um, there's definitely a um, you know, uh, there are definitely a lot of ways to apply alternative data. And I think 
you know, data, alternative data, although very interesting, it is, um, you know, it, it, it is just data at the end of the day, right? So there's, you know, you know, it all, uh, it, it doesn't make it any better or stronger than the traditional or fundamental data that people have been using. I think what's really interesting is uh, is actually the creativity, how you want to use this data, right? So, um, so you know, one I think more important than data itself is really it goes down to the individual investor. Whether you're quant or fundamental, it's actually the same, right? What is your investment hypothesis and your thesis that you want to apply? Right. And then you go out and hunt for the data. But I think the benefit of alternative data is that it gives you so much more possibility to answer questions that, you know, you've, you have always had, but perhaps, you know, we're not able to answer. And I'll give you an example. So, um, so corporate culture is very important, right? If you, if you worked in the industry for a while, you know, you, you know that, um, you know, if you work in a company where morale is very high, um, you know, people tend to be more productive. People, there's tends to be less workplace accidents. People tend to want, you know, they're likely to be more innovative, right? Because they actually want the company to succeed versus where, versus a company where everybody is apathetic. They, they, they couldn't wait to, for the bell to ring so they can go home. You know, they just try to do the minimum to, to get by what's called quiet quitting. So culture and sentiment is something that's very, very, uh, important. It's not really particularly, uh, you know, related to any sort of investment hypothesis, but just generally, are these in general good companies to invest in? Or are they just, you know, res- apart from the catalyst, right? It was, like, oh, well, it's a good company to invest in because they have a, they have a new product coming out, but just general quality of a given company. And I think this is where alternative data can also be, be used. So, so, you know, that's an example where a question, you have this question that you always want to answer. It's certainly very important and when you invest in a company, but you never really had the opportunity to. But now, with alternative data, by analyzing what people say, uh, how they behave, um, do they complain a lot on the internet? What don't they don't complain a lot? You can kind of get a sense of, you know, what's going on inside the company. That was really interesting, that piece you said about how it's not necessarily better than the traditional data. It's just it can be applied differently. So I'm wondering, it does seem like these large institutions have gained kind of an advantage over retail investors with this data. Um, We can access it or use it maybe to the same extent, but I'm wondering, is there any of these data sources you think retail investors should be paying attention to and maybe use in addition to their fundamental analysis? Yeah, I I mean, I think you're right. Institutional investors have always had an advantage compared to retail investors simply because this is what they do. Right? It's their job. I mean, you know, my job is to look at this, you know, 10, 12 hours a day and trying to create value for our investors, right? Uh, you know, whether they be institutional investors or, you know, retail investors, but, you know, Robico as an institutional investment firm, this is our job. And, you know, we do this all day long and there's a lot of people looking, doing this and we all discuss and this is, this is our, again, this is what we do. So just the amount of effort and the time and the people spent, I, I think is difficult for retail investors to, to, to match. Um, a lot of data sources I mentioned here, right? Such as, you know, social media, um, you know, what NGOs put out, um, you know, for example, uh, bulletin boards and chat, chat, you know, um, chat, chat, chat groups, et cetera. These are all available to retail investors, right? So I think, you know, if retail investor want, they can access them. And they, I think you, you should actually monitor them when you're, when you are a uh, invest, investor, whether you're institutional or retail. Um, fundamental analysis is obviously important, but you also need to monitor, for example, the sentiment, et cetera, right? You can have the best fundamentals in the world if the sentiment isn't great, it's still not going to perform. So uh, as a retail investor, I think you should monitor them. I think the difficulty, so the data access isn't necessarily the problem, but what you do with it, because there is a lot of data, right? There is a lot of data out there. You can look at all kinds of different sources. And, you know, even more, um, financial data is very famously noisy. So, you know, what we do, right? Obviously I'm a quant. So what we do is we, we take all this data and then we apply you know, these statistical techniques such as natural language processing, such as machine learning, 
trying to analyze and gain insight into these data. And then once we gain insights, right, we, we don't just say, okay, well, this is right. We actually want to test it to see if it holds water historically, right? See if we could, you know, use the what's called a scientific process to explain whether our ideas are right or not. I think, you know, if you're a, if you're a retail investor, that might be a, that might be a very hard threshold to cross. Right to to write up all these machine learning algorithms to analyze the data you get, and then to um, and then to anal and then to you know put everything together, synthesize it into a portfolio that makes sense. And, and also, by the way, you know you typically as a, as a fund investor, institutional investor, you typically hold a reasonable number of stocks, right? So anywhere between one hundred stocks or more. Um, as a retail investor, you probably don't hold that number of stocks. So what might happen is that you know you could buy a few stocks. You know, they could work out really well and you make a lot of money, which is great. Or, you know, they actually could not work well, right? Because there are a lot of idiosyncratic risks that affects how a given security performs. More than just the fundamental, more than just the sentiment, right? You know, we all know that what's going on right now, the Fed is uh, hiking rates. So, this, you know, these uh, a lot of these high previously high flyers are not doing well. But, you know, going back two years, right, all of a sudden, you know, world breaks down in the pandemic, right? What traditionally has has been a very uh, stable company, um, say a, a retailer, that all of a sudden nobody's going to retailer anymore. So these are just things you cannot predict, right? Uh, I think what the advantage of institutional investor, at least a quant institutional investor over a uh, retail investor is that we not only are able to process these huge amounts of data using advanced statistical techniques and put them together, we also hold a lot of these names so that we hedge out as much as we can, the idiosyncratic risk, and we basically hedge our bets. So, you know, we have an idea, we think this can work, but we're not sure if any given stock that exhibit these traits can work well. So we buy a lot of them so that overall we believe, you know, it, it, the, the idea that we have can, can, can work. I, I think that's the challenge of the retail investor. I'm curious to know what you think, I guess, the implications are of this evolving quant space for retail investors. It's interesting to me because you mentioned you have to buy a lot of companies to generate alpha. You need to do these alternative um, techniques to generate alpha. Is that the case for retail investors? Um, or are we able to, I guess, generate alpha in different ways because we have smaller accounts and we're not subject to the same constraints? So it's not necessarily the same issues as for us as it is for larger firms? Yeah, so you're right. Uh, retail investors are not subject to, first of all, you can buy a small company, right? And, and, and without really moving the market, which, you know, for some of the larger institutional investors such as ourselves, it's very difficult, right? Where we have what's called a capacity. So if we invest in you know these smaller companies, we can only buy a certain amount. And it depends on how much work money we're trying to put to work that might not might or might not move the dial, right? So for a retail investor, you certainly can. So I think retail investors do have a certain advantage. There's also, you know, I guess if you have smaller positions, you can be more nimble, right? And only not moving the market, but you can also um, you know, trade in and out of certain 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 names, I guess much quicker. The difficulty, though, again, is that uh, retail investors, because of the information processing capacity um, and um, and also the fact that, uh, you know, there's just uh, you just hold a small number of stocks. So you, you could actually get, you know, again, buy something that that that, that turns out very well. But, you know, you could also buy something that's uh, that that just happens to not not, not really work. There's, so there's a lot more idiosyncratic risk. Right. Uh, having said that, I, I think, you know, retail investor can try to look into quantitative investors. So, so you know, buy, buy into quantitative funds. Right. So I think a lot of um, historically, you know, quant quantitative funds are, you know, being uh, typically the, the asset owner that I invest in them are institutional. Right. So the sovereign wealth funds or the big pension funds. I think retail investor can try to do a little bit more um you know, trying to understand quantitative investing a bit more. And I think in particular to for millennial investors, I think this is actually something that could, could be very interesting because I think millennials do, are, are, you know, they, 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 they are the internet generation, right? They, they do grow up, you know, you know, be, uh, you know, using all these uh, machine learning enabled apps and, you know, services. So I think they, they probably, they, the, the resistance 
or the acceptability to quant funds are, you know, the resistance will be lower and they're more acceptable to quant funds. So I think, you know, millennial investors can probably, you know, do some investigation, do some education on how do quant funds really work? How, how do they add value? Um, and they're, they're able to, you know, perhaps, you know, um, invest some of their, uh, you know, investment accounts into these, uh, into these quantitative funds. I really wanted to talk with you about this today because I think it's important for retail investors to know kind of what they're up against in the other side of the trade. And I like that you mentioned um, it's not necessarily a bad thing. We kind of have our edge with smaller accounts, but I guess I am still wondering that piece of this evolving quant space. Like, are there any implications that we should be aware of or um, anything negative that maybe could impact us? Or what are your thoughts on that? So, so I think we're actually retail investor probably have an advantage over institutional investor are these micro stocks less liquid. Um, you know, I'll, I'll give you a, the, the the meme stocks actually, right? So these are things where retail investors probably have an advantage over institutional investor because you know institutional investors first of all they, we typically invest in larger stocks just because of the size of the uh, the asset we're trying to and trying to employ right so you know it's really difficult to put a lot of money into into work to work for smaller stocks and a lot of these smaller stocks you know when you're when you're a large larger investor you probably would not invest in them because we typically look for high quality companies right companies that have you know stable cash flow that have you know uh, experienced management that have a well-defined business plan or, you know, as a, at least in a, in a, you know, in a sector that we think are, you know, are in a, probably have a positive outlook. And, and we've seen, seen some example, right? Uh, AMC, um, you know, or, or, or some other, other uh, you know, GameStop. These are examples where um, actually retail investor had an edge over, over, um, over institu- institutional uh, asset managers and hedge funds. Um, you know, I don't. I don't want to wade into the legality of a lot of in, in retail investors, perhaps coordinating and buying something, and then you know, and moving the stocks way out of its fundamentally reasonable price range, right? But I think you know, perhaps some of these smaller names, uh, less trafficked than let's consider lower quality stocks, um, retail investors do have an advantage. Having said that, right, I, I do want to put in the caution that, you know, these stocks, you know, some of these stocks, um, such as, you know, GameStop, um, you know, during which, during, you know, during the meme stock craze, uh, their, their price and their fundamentals are completely out of whack, right? So, so you know, so, so uh, buyer beware, I would just say that. Mm-hmm. So I want to kind of jump back to the machine learning piece, because I think that's really interesting and kind of how that technique and technology is used. Can you uh, talk about what machine learning is and then how it's used to kind of make sense of alternative data? So thanks for asking me this question, Rebecca. So what is machine learning, right? Machine learning, there's a lot of talk about machine learning. There's a lot of hype about machine learning. If you want to think about it, it's just a continuous evolution at least in a financial sense, it's just a continuous evolution of what um, quant investor have been using um, historically. So historically, quantitative investor have a cert- certain set of tools that we use, such as regression, uh, such, you know, et cetera. Uh, basically, we look at the relationship between input data and output data, subject to our investment hypothesis, of course. Now, machine learning is really powerful in the sense that machine learning allow us not just to examine linear relationships, Right, so that means that you know if, a, if an input goes higher, then the output goes higher. If it's positively related, otherwise it's you know goes lower. If it's negatively related, but it also allows us to examine nonlinear relationship. Right, so what happens to um, a given security price in the presence of uh, two two indicators, for example, simultaneously, or if an indicator goes really really high, you know maybe the price will go really high. Right, so I'll give you an example. So uh, you know typically higher the earning, the better the stock price, right? That's, that's very basic. But, um, you know, it could also be that a company has really high earning, but hey, guess what? There's some strong indication that this company could be cooking its book, right? So in the presence of these two indicators happening, is that, well, typically that this, the stock price 
might not go higher because we don't even know if the, if the earnings can be trusted. This is what's called interaction effect. So machine learning can detect all of these different combinations, right? So more than just linear effect, you can detect interaction effect um, and also nonlinearity. Uh, that's, that's what makes machine learning so powerful. And I think another thing that makes machine learning so powerful is that machine learning is really trained to s sift through a lot of information, right? So when you have a lot of big data inputs, uh, machine learning is trained to sift through all of that to see if you could detect any relationship between the input and output. Having said that, that's also where the danger is because, you know, because financial investing is famously noisy. It is famously high dimensional. If you think about it, pretty much anything in the world can really affect the stock's price, right? From its fundamental to the sentiment, to what the Fed is doing, to, you know, maybe it's a CEO tweeted something, right? So there's just like all sorts of information that, that can affect the price. So, so it is really very high dimensional. Now, we don't have nearly as much data and history to train a machine learning algorithm as compared to the dimensions that can affect the price. So what I mean is that there is a, uh, the degree of freedom is very, very high to use a very technical term, right? So in this situation, what you find is that if you just say, I just want to throw this data into this machine learning algorithm I have to see what it finds, it could find something very, very, very ridiculous. So for example, right, if you take the letters in a, um, in a stocks ticker, like G-O-O-G for, for alphabet, right? Or meta for, for meta, um, you know, what you might find is that actually if the third letter is say, um, all the stocks with third letter in the ticker that begins with S and short all the stocks with third letter with uh, alphabet O, you will actually have a phenomenal height, you know, phenomenal return over the last 60 years. That actually is an example that somebody has worked out. Obviously, right? to a human say, this is total nonsense. This is a total happen by chance. So this is what I mean by, you know, very high, high dimensionality, right? Um, but, you know, if, if a machine learning algorithm, when you, when you do that, it actually might not know, um, oh, this is nonsensical. So, so what we need then is actually, even though machine learning is very powerful, it can detect a lot of information, you still need human oversight, right? Humans still need to impose some structure on it precisely because the dimension is so high. Machine learning will do what it does. Right, but it cannot interpret if it makes sense or not. So it's a powerful tool, and it's, that's both a good and bad thing. And I think you know, even for you know, actually for quants, you do need to have human in there. You know, the quants need to design the experiment with the machine learning setup so that it learn the stuff that it learns is actually sensible, uh, rather than say, oh, I'm going to buy every every stock that begins with A and short every stock that ends with Z, right? So this is an example of what I mean by high order, high degree of freedom. So would it be fair to say it's still in kind of the early stages of any firm's investment process and informing decisions because it's still kind of being worked out, like you said, that um, it yeah. might not be really serving your decisions in any way yet? Machine learning is definitely in use, okay? It's definitely being applied by large institutional investors such as ourselves. We def we are applying it for our investment process, right? To, to the benefit of our investors. But uh, I think the general public, and even, you know, maybe perhaps it's even the fall of some of our, um, some investment professionals that they, there tends to be a, a lot of hype around machine learning. Now you think machine learning is this, uh, this wonder drug that can cure all ills, it really isn't the case. Machine learning is another tool in the toolbox. It is a powerful tool. It can do stuff that previous tools cannot do, right? For example, detect nonlinearity, but you have to know how to use it, right? If you use it uh, in an uninformed manner, it can actually lead to a lot of problems for you. And the worst thing is that you actually might not even know what the problem are, right? So, so, so I think machine learning is being applied we are still, um, I personally believe we're still very early in seeing the power of machine learning uh, as an, as, in, in the application of financial investment, um, but it is being applied, but at the same time, you need to be very careful with it. <laughs> like like that's that saying, right? With great power comes great responsibility. Because machine learning can can do a lot of unintuitive stuff if you don't put, um, you know, if you don't put structure or constraints on it, um, you know, you do need to be very careful. So you need to know what you're doing. That's what I'm trying to say.
So I want to switch gears a little bit because as we know, AI, machine learning, all these um, technologies are really shaping the way that investment and quant firms can um, include them in their investment process. They're also just shaping our future in the companies and our world in different applications in healthcare vehicles as we know it. So I'm wondering, how do you think investors can participate in these trends? What is the best way that we can also, um, yeah. I guess, reap the benefits of some of these? And should we be looking at investing in specific companies that are exposed to these trends? Or are you more in favor of just us buying maybe a basket of these companies in a thematic ETF? What are your thoughts on that? Great question, Rebecca. So I, I definitely think machine learning is a uh, important trend, right? Um, you know, it's just like computing is an important trend, right? Computing, you know, changed the world. Uh, cellular phone, mobile communication changed the world. Internet changed the world. These are all major trends. I think machine learning is a major trend. I think it will impact the world um, to see which one is going to be a winner is very difficult. Right. Uh, if you think about it, back in the um, early Internet revolutions, you have all these dot coms. Right. Um, how many of them turn out to be winner? Probably not as many as the, all the, <laughs> as the names that were listed. Right. If you if you can recall that far. Um, but it is a very real trend. So I think, you know, I, I think, you know, investing in any trend, you, you mentioned thematic. I think that really is the way to do it, right? You want to identify a theme and you want to kind of spread your bets, um, you know, to, to, um, to identify companies that will ultimately benefit from this theme and merge the other side. You know, as, as with any investing, right, you have the beginning stage where ideas being created, business model being explored. We don't really know who's winning to what sort of the hype stage. To the, the growth stage where, you know, okay, some practical, tangible results are seen, you know, you see some, uh, some benefits and then you have a lot of people jumping in, right? And then you get to the overhype stage where valuation becomes very stretched, becomes very dangerous. Um, then you have the reckoning, <laughs> some, you know, a bunch of companies implode and, you know, a lot of consolidation. And then it goes into more steady state development, right? So we see that with the internet. Uh, we see that with computing. Uh, I'm certain we're going to see it with machine learning, uh, with what two point, you know, what three point anything of these nature. So uh, it is very, very difficult to tell who's going to win, it, mainly because you know this thing is still being developed, it's still being explored. People are still trying to apply it in a way that makes sense, right? And there's still a lot of unseen factors that's you know that could cause that could cause some of these some very even very good companies to you know just happens to uh, they just happen not to make it because of external in, external environmental impacts that may perhaps funding rates has gone up right it's very expensive to to borrow money and you just don't have enough runway to grow your business so i think if you want to invest in a theme I def and i definitely think machine learning is a theme that's worth investing in i think the best way to do it probably is to buy a basket um, of related companies and hopefully that, you know, you have some company that will survive it, that do well. Um, there are many thematic funds you can invest in that can help you do this as well. So I think that's the best way to do it. You mentioned that once these trends become popular, sometimes they can become overhyped and they run the risk of overconfidence and then overpriced. Do you think we're there yet with some of these themes or not yet? You know, I, I definitely think some of these, uh, you know, it's, we've seen it before, right? So some of the themes I, I personally do think are probably a bit more overhyped, right? I think, for example, um, you know, machine learning is very powerful, but, and it's very powerful in finance. It, it allows us to do a lot of things that were not, it was not able to be done before. But if you think machine learning is something that, uh, that can help you invest basically perfectly to generate, you know, basically a smooth, you know, monotonic increasing line with no drawdowns, no volatility. You know, I think, I, th I think you'd be either misinformed or the person that's telling you is this is not being completely transparent. Right. I do think that, um, for some of these newer technologies, right. Um, at the present moment, um, you know, apart from machine learning, you know, some of these newer, newer technologies, uh, at the present moment, um, you know, perhaps the promise or the hype 
is uh, is still more than where the technology is at the moment. Right. Having said that, you know, you, you, you people people have different opinions, um, and, and you, you do have to keep on you know investing and exploring. So the question is, how do you do it judiciously? That's the that's a billion dollar question. Definitely. I'm also wondering if there are any other major themes or trends that you're watching that we haven't talked about yet. They don't have to be technology based. That's actually a very, very interesting question. So I, I think, first of all, sustainability is a huge theme. I don't want to get into the politics of it, but um, if you look at the hard scientific data, the world is warming. Uh, we have more and more unpredictable weather. There's talks about Greenland's ice sheet melting and uh, could raise the ocean level by, uh, by one foot around the, across the world. One foot might not sound like much, but it actually is a very big impact, right? When, when, when there's storm surges, et cetera, you know, that's, that is really a big deal. You have all the social tensions, you know, you know, between the genders, between the races. I mean, I'm not saying sustainability is something that is definitely the panacea that can solve this. I think a lot of this needs actually government intervention and, and more than just financial, financial world. But sustainability is definitely a theme that is worth watching. Another one is uh, really just, you know, biotech, right? So for example, uh, the application of machine learning, we, we were talking about machine learning, but machine learning is actually very powerful in, in, in biotech. Uh, for example, the problem of protein folding, right? It was considered one of the toughest problems in biology. And, you know, recently, uh, because through the application of machine learning, we can start to understand how the process happened and how it unfolds. Um, and if you think about um, two and a half years ago when COVID happened, right, globally, all of a sudden we went from being out in the world to everybody's locked down. That was a huge scare. Um, and, and yet two and a half years later, a lot of us, lives are back to normal, right? You know, we, we go about our everyday lives. We might have to wear a mask, but for the most part, you're not you're not forced to be at home anymore. You're not, you know, sanitize everything you ever, you touch or can come contact into, right? Uh, although you should still wash your hands, I think. Just generally, it's good practice. But, um, you know, that only happened because of mRNA, at least in the Western world, right? Where we were able to receive mRNA-based vaccines. You know, our lives are back to normal because of breakthrough in biotech. This is a tremendous technology. And I just think that we're barely scratching the surface of the biotech revolution. You know, um, they're thinking about actually possible cures for Alzheimer's and all these other diseases. Think about how, how, much, um, how much that's going to change the world, really. Right. So I, I think, you know, sustainability and biotech are two very broad trends that is definitely worth watching. There are obviously sub themes within it, but these two trends are massive. And I think that's going to really affect us uh, from years to come. I want to talk a bit more with you about sustainability because you have a background in sustainable investing. You're previously head of sustainable investments at a asset management company. You have interest in ESG. You have lots of papers written on this. So I'm wondering if you can talk a bit about why investors should care about ESG and sustainability. What would be the benefits of including these considerations in their investment process? Yeah. So there are two reasons why you should care about it. One reason is personal, right? Just your personal preference. And, I, and again, something that I don't want to go into because we all have different beliefs. I think that's actually something that you need to be very uh, clear about when you when we talk about sustainability. Sustainability is really an individual preference, right? If you want to, you know, there, sustainability means a lot of things. It means different things to different people, right? You could care about climate. You can care about societal issues. You can care about whether the company has, you know, is paying its worker a living wage and provide reasonable benefit. These are all under the definition of sustainability. I'm not saying, and, and I'm not saying whether one is more worthy than the other, right? It's all, it's actually all important depending on your definition. And I think it's a, it's an individual preference. So, so you should care about sustainability mainly if you've wanted your money to express your personal value and preference. Okay. That's one thing. Uh, and I don't want to talk about that because everybody's different. But you should also care about sustainability if you actually want better returns. Okay. That's true. That's a pretty bold statement. But it's not every single case of sustainable investment will generate higher returns. So that's something that you people need to be very clear about. Sustainability can only lead to a higher return 
under the condition of what's called financially financial materiality, right? And what do I mean by that? So a sustainable issue is material to a company if whether a company does well or not well on this sustainable issue, sustainability issue has a dramatic impact on its operation. So I'll give you an example. So Robico, you know, we're actually one of the world leader in sustainability. It's, Robico is very, very serious about sustainability. So Robico is not a Johnny come lately when it comes to sustainability, right? People, we've been doing this for 30 years, okay? As long as we've been doing quant. And um, there's a lot of people actually at Robico whose full, sole focus is on sustainability, right? More than I've seen at any other firm I've been at. So Robico definitely, you know, we definitely are very careful about our carbon footprint, um, how our actions impact the environment and the community we operate in. And, you know, we, we, we try as much as we can. We, we, you know, we recycle everything that we, we could. So Robico should score very high, you know, depending on how you value it, but should score very high on E. And yet E is not a financially material sustainability topic for Robico because you know, we're, we're, we're an investment company, right? So we don't have the carbon footprint of the power generator, of a steel manufacturer, of a heavy industry company, right? So we do well on E, and yet whether we do well or maybe perhaps not so well has very little impact on, on Robico's performance as a company, right? So E is not a financially material topic for Robico. Um, another topic that you know, false within sustainability is uh, its employees talent, right? Employee motivation, you know, how, how happy employees and how satisfied employees are, and how well employees are taken care of by the company when the, when the need arises, right? Um, so Robica also does very well on, on this issue, could be called the S, right? The social aspect or the particular employment, uh, employee aspect, employee um, wellness aspect of sustainability. Robico does very well on this topic as well. And this is actually a very important financially material metric for Robico because Robico, you know, we can deliver value to our clients through the action and ingenuity and motivation of our employees, right? So whether our employees are very happy, you know, I, I really identify with this company. I want to do, I want this company to do well. I want to deliver value to, to our, to our investors so that we can, you know, thereby make Robico does well. So this is actually a topic that's financially material. To Rubico. So the S aspect of sustainability is material for Robico. E, you know, which we also very care very much about, is not as material, right? On the other hand, if you're, you know, if you are a, um, let's say a heavy industry company and you have, you know, these assembly lines that, and um, you have a lot of employees who are just, I mean, for lack of a better word, you know, a, a cog in the machine, any individual person has very high sentiment or very, very, very happy with the way that he's, he or she is being treated by the company. Well, it's very important from just from a humanist perspective, right? It's important to make sure that your employees are satisfied and happy. It might not impact the financial performance of your company that much. You know, where on the other hand, the environmental aspect, you know, if a company is very efficient in their operation, thereby they have lower environmental footprint compared to its compared to competitors, that can actually impact the financial bottom line of a given company, right? So sustainability, what I'm trying to say is that actually has a link to, uh, to, to financial performance, but only through this channel called materiality. And, and I think this is something that, uh, you know, I hope the listener can, can understand, right? Not all higher sustainability rated company will lead to better uh, stock return or better price return, but only those issues are material to how company operates. And there's actually uh, emerging literature uh, from academia now that's actually discussed this topic. So uh, we're now finding more and more evidence of uh, the linkage between sustainability and financial performance. Right. So just to kind of tie this all together, um, for investors looking to incorporate this into their investment process, should we be looking at, so you mentioned 
think about what's material to that company. So for an energy company, we know it's largely environmental concerns. And then maybe the other two are a little less important, but they're still important in terms of like indigenous groups and getting federal regulator approval and such. Mm -hmm. So figuring out that material aspect. And then I guess, can you just walk us through maybe what else are we looking for? What type of information on the company's financial statements? and that type or is that less important yeah no so i I think sustainability is an aspect of investing right and in fact all of the information you can derive from alternative data you know apart from the the more traditional factors that my colleague pim has discussed with you are important but you know the traditional factors the financial statement data they also matter right and you know when you invest in a it, it is a high dimensional problem you're solving. And every single piece of information is just part of the puzzle, right? So, you know, maybe traditional factor investing with traditional data gives you a, um, gives you a pretty good holistic, pretty good view of, of say the, you know, the, the front facade of a building. If you think about investing as, you know, buying a house, right? It gives you a good facade of what it looks like from outside, perhaps on the inside, but, you know, with, with, with sustainability consideration of well, alternative data, you can get a, a broader understanding. You can maybe look at the foundation, whether the foundation is good, maybe, maybe the, you know, the house wiring is good, right? Um, you still cannot understand everything, I guess, because, you know, in order to do that, you probably have to be an insider, right? And, and you know, unless they disclose that having inside information is illegal, uh, but you can try to get more information than what you can do with traditional approaches, traditional data. Having said that, right, traditional data and traditional approaches are all all important. And I think alternative data, um, sustainability data, sustainability consideration, just com- can, can complement um, the, the information where you would traditionally get and give you a more holistic view of the investment puzzle. The last piece I want to talk to you about, because we just learned um, from Pim all about factor investing, I'm wondering, is sustainability almost becoming a factor in of itself? And what is the link between sustainability and factors? Do some factors um, score higher on sustainability that we should know about? Yeah, in general, traditionally, you know, I think there are a lot of definitions of sustainability. Traditionally, though, you know, higher quality companies typically have higher sustainability score, right? Because of uh, perhaps they have better governance. Uh, perhaps, you know, because they're higher quality, they would consider more of these issues, right? That, that could affect, uh, how their company's reputation, for example, their indigenous group, but, you know, how, how maybe their operation will impact with indigenous groups or, you know, the community they operate in. I, I guess the more common factors that Pim discussed, um, quality probably has more to do with sustainability, but we believe, uh, you know, at least I believe sustainability is a totally different new factors. Than, uh, than the traditional factors. Uh, so there's positive correlation of quality, but I think it, there's other dimensions of, uh, of consideration that is not captured by traditional factor investing when it comes to um, that sustainability derived factors would, can capture. Um, you know, for example, energy fi- resource efficiency we talked about, right? Having a lower environmental footprint. Some of the higher quality companies are heavy industry companies that they, you know, having although very stable cash flow, they're probably not the most environmentally friendly um, companies around the world. So, so these are additional dimensions that sustainability can capture that traditional factors cannot capture. So, I, I think you know, to long story short, I, I think sustainability is emerging as an another definition, another factor. Uh, within the world of factor investing. And in fact, this is what we have done at Robico. We have, um, you know, using the sustainability derived sensibility, create a lot more new factors into our portfolio, right? So, and the, the benefit of this is that actually what we end up with is that, you know, under the condition of uh, materiality, we end up with basic uh, portfolios that, you know, we expect will deliver higher alpha but also have better sustainability characteristics, such as, you know, more satisfying employees, right? Happier employees, uh, lower carbon footprints, et cetera. 
That was great. That's all the questions I had for today. Thank you so much for joining me today, Mike. Before we close out the episode, where can the audience go to learn more about you, your work, and everything you do? Yeah, thanks for that question. So, you know, I, I'm a member of the uh, Rubico Quantitative Investment Team, right? Um, so it's obviously not just me. We have a very large and talented group of people. That's, uh, you know, that, that, that is working very hard. And, you know, we, we, we like to write about our, our findings and talk about our findings. So anything you want to learn, you can find us at uh, www.robico.com. Um, you know, you could also um, connect with all of us, you know, Pim, myself and others on, on LinkedIn. Um, we like to post uh, our latest research, our latest findings, or just general thought of the day on these uh, social media channels. So please reach out and we'd love to, uh, we'd love to discuss these interesting findings with you. Thank you so much. Why did Warren make decisions to sell something when he was wrong? He was wrong in the airlines. He was wrong in IBM years ago. He makes mistakes and he moves on. And the answer is facts. John Maynard King said, you know, when the facts change, I change. What do you do?